Uh, some of you are taking this class because it's a required class for your business program. Many others are taking it because it is something that's incredibly interesting to you. But I want to assure you uh, one thing, that this class will change your thinking, it will change your life if you allow it to really, to, if you, if you really uh, strive to understand the purpose of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, regardless of whether you actually start your own business someday. So I think you're gonna find this class is really valuable and I am very excited to be here today my name is Scott Peterson. I am the Executive Director at the Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. As you will find out, I'm a longtime entrepreneur. I started my first business in 1988. Um, I've done seven businesses, and I've had an interesting, uh, challenging experience in every single one of them. And they've all been a great blessing in my life and helped me to learn things that I never could have learned without going this hard path of, of doing my own thing, so to speak. Um, also, the speakers that we introduce in the coming weeks, they each have a different story. Um, sometimes it'll, you know, it'll be just like uh, you know, this traditional white guy that you see here at Brigham Young University, because why? It's the demographics of Utah County, to be honest. But we work very hard to find uh, female entrepreneurs and to find uh, other entrepreneurs because entrepreneurship is not um, only for uh, white guys, so to speak. Um, that doesn't denigrate any of you guys that are white guys, but at the end of the day there's a lot of talk about that today and I just want to make sure that you recognize that it re doesn't really matter where we come from. So for example, my father was a high school AP English teacher and my mother didn't work and there were seven of us. I worked from the time that I was 10 years old, uh, first picking cherries and then later on uh, making onion rings. Now I want you to think about what that would be like when you're 13 years old to make onion rings. First of all, you're just sort of getting interested in, you know, girls and you know, then your fingernail beds, they turn brown, okay? And, then your hair, it kind of smells. And it's hard to get that smell out of it. Even when you wash it, it's really hard. You cry for the first 15 minutes every time that you go to work. And um, <laughs> I paid for my own expenses. I paid for all of my clothes. I paid for my car. I paid for everything. I paid for my mission. Um, and it taught me a lot of things. So I didn't have you know, this traditional easy path um, I, I didn't have the opportunity to go to Brigham Young University, for example. I came home from my mission to an empty bank account. So this empty bank account, and then I, 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 was, I knew that I was going to be getting married uh, in the not too distant future because I'd been writing to this young lady for about 10 months on my mission, and um, I had a confirmation about what was going to happen. So uh, that happened just exactly the way I knew it was going to happen. So we got married about six months after I came home and after buying a ring and paying for my, uh, my car and all the other stuff that you have to have just to live and I was saving money to uh, be able to go to uh, school. And then a month after we got Gary married, guess what? Ah, Marilyn got pregnant. Wow, so then we had a decision to make. How are we gonna handle this? We figured out how that happened. Um, <laughs> So, so then um, Marilyn said, well, I'd really like to be a mom. I know that I could do many different things. I know that I've been successful uh, as a banker. I've been promoted many times, but I really feel this sense of uh, urgency and desire for myself to be a mom. I said, okay, well, we're gonna make that happen. So I started to work and I actually went to, uh, started to work and went to night school for a number of years. But I never graduated from uh, uh, a university as you will, and it's important. All five of my children graduated from Brigham Young University. That's how important education is to me. Uh, but education is important for everyone, and so at the end of the day, I found that uh, the way that I received an education is I read. I read a lot. I read before Audible existed. So I actually had to sit down and read a book and underline it and have arrows and everything else drawn towards it so that 
Well, what I'm really trying to say at the end of the day is no one has an easy path. We all have to fight and claw and scratch. Sometimes, you know, you'll have a father or mother that's, you know, wealthy in some of these things that make, but that's not the majority of us. The majority of us really have to scratch and eke out uh, how things are going to work. So, um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about how I got started uh, actually my, with my own business because one of the things that you all try to figure out was, is how do I get from sitting in this chair to standing on this stage? And you know what? You put one foot in front of the other every single day of your life, making good decisions, remembering that you're free to choose, liberty and eternal life, right? You got the whole screw. You're free to choose all of your decisions. So it's all the little choices that you make that accumulate into massive things that happen in your life. So I remember my mission president when he showed me a picture of President Kimball when he was on his mission, and he was on his mission in the Midwest, and he was sitting on a, uh, I just saw this picture recently because I took my mission president to dinner. He's 87 years old, walking with a cane, so forth. But he showed me this picture uh, that he had showed us 39 years, 40 years earlier of President Kimball. He was in his office, sitting on the porch with his shoes off, in regular clothes, he looked just like a kid, but then what did he become? And that was what my mission president said to each one of us, is that we have the power to become who it is that we decide that we're going to become because of decisions that we make every single day. So I started out in uh, sales. Imagine that, right? I just come home from my mission and I had had a fantastic experience that transformed every part of me. In fact, I think that everything that I hold dear in my life happened because of the, not just serving a mission, but the way that I served my mission. And I'd made a decision, I made a decision, a conscious decision, that those same holy habits and righteous routines that I had become accustomed to as a missionary, that I would live those for the rest of my life. And those principles, they transformed my life. Uh, they continued to transform my life. So I started out in sales, and in the first uh, six months, I was, I was the top sales representative in the company within actually five months. So in six months, they made me a sales manager. And so here I am, I'm a 22-year-old guy, and I'm a brand new sales manager, and I'm hiring people that are 40 and 50, and it's like, you know, Think about it. It's not that easy uh, to make yourself that mature, that wise, that experienced, that someone who is 40 or 50 wants to work for somebody who is 22. But it can happen because it's the frame of mind that you have about yourself and the fact that you become an expert in your field. Did you know that if you take 15 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes a day on any subject and you studied it relentlessly for a period of like three months, you're going to know more about that subject than just about anybody else except for someone who might be teaching it. It might be their career. I mean, there is so much information that you can gain if, you're sim if you simply you know, put one foot in front of the other. So sales management, to, it took me a while to figure that out actually. Uh, uh, just a really quick story. I remember my boss sitting down with me after about 18 months and he said, you know, Scott, nobody questions your ability to sell. But, you know, I don't know that you've quite figured out how it is that you help somebody else transform their life, how to make them successful. And he had a point. There's an awful lot to learn. And I said, well, Jay, at the end of the day, I can point that finger back to me, and it's true but we don't have any training programs. You picked somebody raw, you moved them across the country from Salt Lake City to Kansas City, and then you didn't come in. There are no training, because we were a, a younger company. And um, at that point, I really started to think about it differently, and I said, well, I'm gonna become an expert in leading others how to do this, so I did. And then I became a division manager, a national sales manager, and a VP and general manager, and, and, uh, that are, um, and this was for this company right here. And then uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Kernite was the first company, but then 
this orthopedic company was the one that hired me as the national sales manager. So I had the opportunity to work for a company that uh, uh, Stryker actually purchased. Stryker's a huge company today, but they purchased the company shortly after I left, so that's where these products sit today. Those are uh, orthopedic products. You can see this particular um, product right here. This was an innovated by the founder of our company. He had a patent on it. He took uh, 15 layers of uh, plaster, uh, put them in foam on one side, the one that gets the skin, and flannel on the other side, and then just put it in those big containers. You could pull it off, cut it off, put it in water, put it on. And instead of having the orthotech having to go through layer by layer by layer, it was a great innovation, you know, that allowed uh, uh, splinting to be a much easier process. So we took this product across the whole United States. At any rate, I decided in 1988 to start my own business. I had been uh, I had uh, already done sales, I had already done sales management, I had already been a national sales manager, and when I became a general manager, that gave me experience in supply chain and finance and accounting and all those other areas that were important uh, to be able to help me be well-rounded enough to feel comfortable that I was ready to go on my own. So in 1988, I mortgaged my home. Now I want you to think about this, I had three kids, um, my youngest was uh, uh, just about two years old, two and a half. My oldest was about seven and a half. Um, and we had a house payment and we had two car payments. And I'd been making about 75000 a year. By the way, that's a lot of money back in 1988. And um, now I'm taking my salary and cutting it down to 40, but I have the same expenses. So my wife, how did she react to that, some of you will ask. And the answer is incredibly well. And if I had time, I'd tell you the single experience that gave her confidence that I listened to the spirit and that I made decisions that were thoughtful, gathering all the information that I could gather, looking at my experiences, I said to myself, I've opened up sales territories for other people. I've been able to lead teams. I've been able to manage finances. So I don't have any doubt that I'm gonna be able to go out and do this. And she said, let's go for it. It's not gonna get easier. You know, it's not gonna get, your, your salary's just gonna continue to go up like this, so it's gonna be harder and harder to you know, get away from those golden handcuffs. So at any rate, we mortgaged the house. You'd think that this is a, not a very uh, sexy product line, and you'd be right. It's, you know, first aid cabinets. But what we did is we developed a big um, network of 150 distributors. We were the uh, manufacturer, the OEM manufacturer, had our own uh, product line, and they sold it in distributed protected areas. So we ended up uh, growing the company, and over a period of time, uh, we sold it to Cintas, the uniform people. They're over 10, uh, 10 billion in sales today and uh, they purchased our company in 1997. And that allowed me to do something that was really important and interesting to me, because I've always said to myself that first and foremost, I'm a philosopher. It's true, but you can't make any money in philosophy. So I decided to be a business guy first, and then to become a philosopher. So I wrote this book, Where Have All the Profits Gone? And you would ask, what is this about? First of all, when I say that money, uh, say this uh, uh, title, they say, well, are you talking about your business? Where did all the profits gone? Go? <laughs> and of course, no, I'm actually talking about um, I, writing a book. And this, I decided that I wanted to take a, a, a stab at writing about something that was really interesting to me. Uh, the apostasy. And so I read all of the pseudepigrapha, all of the apocrypha, I mean all of it, all of the apocrypha, all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, all of the Nag Hammadi Library, all of the early Christian writings, and they're extensive. There's volumes that go like this, and you know, they're, I figured I, I read, uh, I don't know, well over 100,000 uh, pages on those, uh, in those areas with the idea of trying to understand how it all started. How did it start with Adam, really? N taking all the LDS perspective out of it, how did it start? 
So I went back to Adam and chronicled all the way through the 19th century and wrote this book, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? If I had more time, I'd go into more of it, but I can't. So a few years later, I wrote another book called Do the Mormons Have a Leg to Stand On? I think that title, I might do a different title now. What do you think? <laughs> I know it's taken you guys a while to figure that one out, but with the direction that uh, has just come out about the, using the word Mormon, um, I thought uh, maybe I'd have changed it. But at the end of the day, what I wanted to do was to show what the early Christians believed in the first century and then what the church teaches. And I can only tell you that uh, for those of you that are uh, students of this in any way that you wouldn't be surprised that the early Christian doctrines match up identically with LDS doctrines. And then I took another stab recently and I wrote this treatise on the book of Abraham with a partner because there's a lot of questions that people have had about the book of Abraham. And so what did I do? I just went and took all their questions one by one, every single one of them, and answered them completely, thoroughly, scholarly, and uh, showed them that their contentions were not even they just don't have a place, they don't have a leg to stand on. There you have it. So why an author? Because I'm interested in those areas and I'm interested uh, in being able to help others come unto Christ. So I also learned about my own future, about learning by faith. And see, this is one of the things that I think that's important to you. You're trying to figure out which direction is your life going to unfold. And the answer is, your life is going to unfold in the manner in which you dictate it. So you're in charge of your own future. You're in charge of setting your own goals. You are in charge of deciding what matters. So last night I spoke to about 1,200 people in my stake and we spoke about this whole idea of that we are free to choose liberty and eternal life, or captivity and death. And we have these two stark choices sitting in front of us. And I quoted this sonnet by, by Shakespeare uh, called The Rape of Lucretia. And I can't uh, quote the whole thing verbatim, but parts of it. For example, where he said, for one sweet grape, who would the vine destroy? If you had the opportunity of having one grape or an entire vineyard, which would you choose if you like grapes, right? Or who would buy a minute's mirth, that's delight, to wail a week? Who would do that? Who would actually take and make a decision that gives them joy for one minute only to mourn for an entire week? Who would sell eternity, Shakespeare posited, or a toy. Who would do that? So that is exactly what Lehi was saying in that we are free to choose. And all of these choices accumulate for us and help us to determine who we're actually going to be. But I can tell you that this is a different kind of entrepreneurial venture because you will find that with entrepreneurship, you're going into the unknown. You have no idea where you're going. You don't know where it's going to end but you are exercising a great deal of faith and then putting one foot in front of the other until you finally get there. So, um, after three years of writing, I decided it was time to go back and you know, start doing this again. So I started a company called APU Solutions, which, which brings together the supply chain of the property casualty insurance companies, the collision repair shops, and the salvage recyclers to bring efficiencies for procuring alternative parts to repair vehicles for the insurance industry in the event they decide not to total loss the car but instead to repair it. So this is kind of a cool deal because this turned into a nice business. Yeah, and some of you are saying, you've said that before. I said it a lot. Um, but I noticed another piece of that whole supply chain that was broken at that time, but the technology didn't exist to fix it. And so I said, someday we're going to fix this. So about five years ago, I started another business, which I'll tell you about when I come to it. 
that fixed this area right here. And now all of the uh, communication that's going on back in Hurricane Florence regarding vehicles, we are the uh, software that is running all of that. So we communicate with the towers, we communicate with the insurers, we communicate with the estimatics platforms, with the auto salvage pools that tow millions of cars every year in these kinds of things. And we take these companies paperless and allow them to do it transparently. So, but at any rate, moving forward here, so we we start this company and one of the things that your books that you're reading, there's actually two of them. One is Running Lean by Ash Moria. It's a fantastic book. And the other one is Nail It Then Scale It. Why? Because these books will help open up your eyes about methodology. That it doesn't have to be a mystery as to how you start a business. That it doesn't have to be as risky as you think. But you do have to follow correct principles. And so that's, again, the purpose of this class is to help you to begin to understand what those principles are. But I didn't follow those early on because they didn't exist. So what happened? Well, I, nothing big. I just spent two or three million dollars that I didn't need to. Now, if you had to go out and you know take two or three million dollars out of your pocket to make mistakes, how would you feel about that? But that's exactly what happened, okay? Because we didn't follow the lean process. And um, I learned that boards can be very helpful. So you surround yourselves with people that are smart. So I invited several uh, smart people to join me, not as uh, founders or owners in the business, but investors and board members. Uh, four key people that helped us because we bootstrapped this company between the four of us, myself and three others, all the way through to the end when we sold the business in 2012. We never took venture capital. Long stories behind it. So incremental learning and timely pivots. So it's sort of like a zigzag. You know, that's how you end up ultimately getting to the end of the road. But lest you think that it's easy, there, there are lots of things that happen along the way. Um, I had seeded the company with a half a million dollars, and I had some partners that had put in just a little bit of money from Ernst & Young. And I was on my 20th year wedding anniversary in Paris, France, and I get a call from one of my other partners saying, you know, these two guys, they came in and they raided your bank account. It's true. What had happened was, originally we had gotten funded with $8 million of venture capital. But then April 13, 2000 happened. That's the day the tech market dropped 318 points. And it was the day, it was the beginning of the end of the internet bubble that you heard about as ancient lore, because it was before you guys were, uh, you know, even thinking about such things or babies. But at any rate, um, in uh, so here I am in Paris, France, and I get this call, and and um, that this is on about May 15, 2000, and uh, they had only given us one million of the eight million that had been committed, and so we had already spent that one million dollars on product development. And so really there was just my money left in the bank account and they had come in and taken a bunch of money out. These are just some of the things that I wish I could tell you that these are you know, things that don't happen. I talked to one of my uh, female entrepreneur, entrepreneur friends and she had someone that came in and embezzled a couple million dollars from her. Now, I just want you to think about how that is. Things happen and, you know, and so you have to be prepared for all of these things. I learned that leadership is everything. So I came back from Paris, France, and I stood in front of this team, and they knew what had happened, and I said, people, we're going to get there. So I'm going to make sure that we're going to get there. I'll make sure that we have the money, that your jobs are protected. We're going to take this thing across the River Jordan into the Promised Land. I promise you, we're going to do it. And it did take us 12 years, but we did it, and it was very successful. 
nine of the 15 people that were there that day were all there at the end, and they were able to profit from it because of staying till the end. And so this comes with one of my mottos about everything in life, that never, never, never give up. And if you remember from Winston Churchill, how many of you guys have seen uh, the movie that is just out about, uh, it's called Darkest Hour? Okay, it's a very cool movie. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. If you want to know what entrepreneurship is all about, just go look at that movie and see how, watch him make decisions and go against the grain and how much he has to fight against the establishment in order to make decisions that save Great Britain and help save the war. So he actually gave a speech uh, at the commencement exercises at Oxford University. And as the, I want you to think about what you're expecting at your own commencement exercises. He stands there at the lectern, he looks across just like this, he sees everybody, and then he says, never, never, never give up. And he sits down. That's it. That's all he does. And the chancellor calls him, you know, goes back up to the mic and he says, um, do you have anything else to say? And he stands up again and he looks at them after a pause and he says, never, never, never give up and he sits down, that was it. Now, you think that that, and there's a great lesson to think about there, because that is the sum of life, is that we never give up. Each one of you have a genetic code. Did you know that? Each one of you have a genetic code. It's called a genetic palette. It stays the same throughout mortality from the time that you're born until the time that you die. But what is different is epigenetics. What happens in epigenetics is what is overlaid on your genes. So your genetics are 20 to 50% of who you are. Did you know that? Which means that your epigenetics are 50 to 80% of who you are. What do you think that is? That's your environment. It's your thoughts. It's your actions. It's your desires what you really want. So you got to be careful about what you really want. And um, it's about the food you eat. It's about drugs. It's about all of these external influences that actually write on top of your genes. It's a proven deal. There's no arguing about it. And so what it means is that in the end of the day, you're left and you're free to choose. So it really isn't that you're programmed to do whatever you're going to do. You have a choice. You have a say in the matter of what you're going to be. So we had a successful harvest, and we sold this to a large uh, multi-million dollar company as well, called Autotex. We have to get through this a little bit. So then, in the middle of this, you know, we found out in the middle of this company right here, APU Solutions, we found out that we were going to have to wait until the entire industry went wireless for them to fully adopt our technology. That was a really dark day. Because we had already run out of money five times. In fact, you can see that I don't have any uh, issues speaking publicly in front of people. I don't get nervous. I didn't get nervous then. But my partner, who was watching me make a, an investment pitch to the Bi-State Investment Group, Kansas and Missouri, a group of angel investors. He said, Scott, were you like nervous? And I said, nervous? I never get nervous. What are you talking about? Well, you were shaking up there. And I said, no, I'm not. And I looked at, I went to the doctor. I said, what in the world is wrong? <laughs> but I was so freaked out because of running out of money five times that underneath, you know, uh, I was actually, my body was starting to express all of that stress, okay? So at any rate, um, I decided that when it was going to take who knows how long for the company to, for the industry to go wireless, I went to my partner Charles and I said, Charles, I got a deal for you. I'm going to have you step up to be the president of the company, I'll have you report 
to the board of directors, which is me and three other guys, and I'm gonna go start a different company where I can go make some money, because I don't know how long this is gonna wait. I don't mind the idea of, you know, working for free, and I don't mind the idea of, you know, giving money to the company so it can survive, but I mind the idea of working for free and giving money to the company. So you can go, because I've done that for two years already. So I said, Charles, you run the company, we're already paying for you, I'm gonna go start another business. So we did. Started Best Final, um, actually didn't, uh, wasn't the uh, actual founder, my friend Vance Barrett was, and um, Vance invited me to become his partner. So the two of us, it was very young, it was tiny, uh, the two of us built this company uh, in a period of six years from one million to 35 million. We became the largest vinyl fence company in the country and we sold it. All in the time that it took APU Solutions to get profitable. <laughs> so we started from scratch, built a company here, built, harvested before Best Vinyl ever got, pro or but APU got profitable. All right, so we sold it in 2007, just before the downturn. And here are a few lessons that I think are important for you to think about. You'll never build a company without good people. It's not gonna happen. Great companies are built by great people because they are problem solvers. They're smart, they develop solutions, they, you know, they're motivated, and, and so it's good people that build companies. Every smart CEO recognizes that they are not the reason that the company in the end really succeeded. It was because of the great people that they surrounded themselves with. So individual departments that are well run, I found that we could take accounting, operations, sales, marketing, legal and so forth, and we could take all of these in isolation and we could make them rock. So for example, when someone would watch a sales presentation from Best Vinyl and they saw a sales presentation from one of our competitors, it was like no question about who they were gonna use. It was that difference, that, that big a difference. It was a stark, huge difference. And then um, refining systems and processes. One of the things that I did is I reverse engineered the entire company. And I started from what happens to when somebody picks up the phone and calls us, to the check clears the bank, and they have said, you guys rock. What happens in between? And we develop systems in every part of the company along the way to make sure that with customer experience, it was awesome. That when it came to the installation, perfect. When it came to the sales process, amazing. And so every single part of it, there was a process that was designed that helped us not to trip over ourselves and that every time that we learned new things that could get us in trouble, that we would incorporate those into our processes, procedures, and best practices. And then I learned how important it is to pick good partners. You need to have great partners. If you're going to have a partner and not do it yourself, it's like getting married. So you better, better choose wisely because you're gonna get up every morning and you're gonna to work together and if they're not great partners, then it will be like a lousy marriage and it will never work. Okay, then um, after I sold the business, I went to run one of my portfolio companies, which is still uh, rocking it today. So my partner and best friend, Don Morris, is the CEO of the company and chairman um, but I was the chairman from nine and 10 and helped Don to really figure out how to scale the business. Because it was a small business then doing three or four million in premium, premium. And today we're gonna do about 78 million. We'll do 100 million in premium next year. So this company has grown dramatically and we have a, a, an incredible model. What are the lessons? We have something that's unique. For example, what do we do? We're an open enrollment company, okay? So basically what we do is we onboard people into their employee benefits, and we work with companies that are north of 5,000 employees. So what do we do? Why does it work? Well, 
what the other people do is they, they come in once a year and it's sort of like, you know, uh, a tornado in the office and then they leave. So they come in, do open enrollment, and then they're out of there. But we live with our customers all year long. And so they're our customers forever. And how does that happen? Well, we actually insource our people. So some of our largest customers, we have 20 of our employees that work for them. We pay for them. We pay for their benefits. We train them. We manage them. And they are amazing resources. They are the finest experts in the field uh, of, of, of this. And so because we're there year round and they don't have to pay for these resources, we do so many other things for them that they would have to pay for if they didn't have us that they can't get rid of us. And so we have free access to all their employees and we see all of their employees just like clockwork every 18 months. And we just review their portfolio and, and whatever their uh, companies don't provide in the way of benefits, we offer ancillary benefits, sort of like Affleck, uh, but, uh, that they, that, to fill in the gaps. And I taught Don the difference between A players and B players. When I went in to become the chairman, I said, let's evaluate this position, this position, and this position. And we eventually replaced them, and we put in people that were A players, and then Don watched the whole thing rise. And the difference between an A player and a B player is that an A player can do three times the work of a B player, almost every time. All right, so then I uh, was asked by the Dean of the Marriott School to come and run the Rollins Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. This was back in 2010. And the program at that time was unranked and unknown nationally. But what we did that was unique was we were the first university in the world to adopt the Lean Startup. I had read the book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany by Stephen Blank. He was the father of the modern movement, of the lean movement. And I said, you know what? This is exactly what I experienced when I was you know, starting my companies. And so I, said, I went to the faculty here and said, you know, we had a vision statement that we created that said, we will be the global leader in successful campus-inspired entrepreneurial ventures. We're going to be the best. We're going to be the biggest. And we're going to push out more student businesses out of Brigham Young University than any other university on uh, the planet. And we started a competition called the International Business Model Competition. And it started with, it started with six universities. And last year, it had 600 universities. 6,000 teams participated from 33 countries. And we have changed the nature of the way that developing countries or countries across the globe are teaching and practicing entrepreneurship. So we really do have a remarkable program. And so for the last, um, those are the basic areas that we focused on, curriculum, events, competitions, and mentoring. And we've been now in the top five. Uh, uh, the university doesn't even know this yet, and I'm not allowed to divulge, but I'll just say that we've been in the top five for the last nine years running now since 2010. So, um, yes, okay. All right, now, um, so in the middle of all this, uh, I started a new company called Ramadi that I was telling you about earlier, and I really had, didn't intend ever to run it, but my partner decided to go off to the Wharton School, and he'll be sorry, um, because we're crushing it, and, uh, um, but Omadi um, is a mobile SaaS platform for workforce management. We take, we take people paperless. We help them uh, because of, we do intelligent dispatch, GPS tracking, geofencing, RFID technology. We uh, do route optimization, and we, just, we have some really cool software. So we partner up with the insurance industry and the people that support the insurance industry and the tours, and we are a marketplace for the entire, that's what we do. So um, I actually had to leave BYU for a couple years to go get this scaled up, and then I turned it back to my partner, Charles, who had been with me for how long? Almost 
almost about 18 years because he'd been the guy that I turned over APU Solutions to earlier. So now Charles is uh, running Omadi and doing a fantastic job. So lessons learned, not just the lean startup, but also lean building and lean scaling. So this is really important actually right here. People talk about the lean startup, but there's two other phases of building and scaling. So I learned that I had things out of order the first time. For example, in Omadi, in Omadi I, when I start, when we had 100 rating then customers, then I put all the gas on sales. Well, that revealed that we had problems with our product. We started seeing lots of bugs. We started seeing problems with our architecture. We started seeing problems with customer happiness. We found that the onboarding process wasn't as streamlined as it needed to be. And I wish I had more time to share with you about some of these things, but at the end, I learned that the most important money in the beginning is to go into product and client success. Client success, if we have, if we make sure that our customers are happy and that the process is smooth, um, then we're in a better position to begin scaling. If we don't have that, we shouldn't scale yet. And also, if we have problems with client success, it reveals that we actually probably have product problems with our product. And then, if we don't have a good marketing engine, you know, we're catching people at the very beginning of the buyer's journey over here. I call it the headbanging area, because we have to go all the way from here to over here. But if I have a good marketing system, then I'm catching them in the middle, where they're saying, hey, I'm interested. So if we have a great marketing system, then it makes the sales uh, process much more efficient and predictable. At any rate, those are some things that we learned. Now, I mentioned to you, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I only got about six more minutes. I got tied up in too much storytelling. Um, but this is something that nobody had any scientific data to back up 3,000 years ago, did they? But it's true. So 80 years ago, I read this great, well, 30 years ago, I read this great book called Think and Grow Rich. 80 years ago, I wasn't here. 30 years ago, I read this book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it was a, a popular book, it still is today. <coughs> and it was one of Howard Hunter's uh, favorite books, actually. But he said, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. So again, 80 years ago, there's not much scientific data, but now, 20 years ago, this data comes out, and it says even the adult brain is plastic, and able to forge new connections among its neurons and thus rewire itself. You're gonna have these on, so I'll, I'll get, let you see it, but, but the brain rewires itself on something much more ephemeral than what we do. It rewires itself based on what we think. So just like Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Wow. So whenever you like beat up yourself, just remember that you're rewiring your brain to think negatively. Pornography or other negative things, it rewires your brain. It's why it's so blasted hard to get over some of these things. So the moral of the story is be careful about what you think because it will rewrite your history, and that's why you're in charge of who you become. All right, now, why does this matter, this thing of entrepreneurship that I was talking to you about? So here's a study that was done. Right here we see the GDP. Everybody know what the GDP is? The global uh, gross, domestic, gross domestic product, right? But nobody's heard about the GEI. That's the Global Entrepreneurial Index. As the global entrepreneurial index rises, so does the GDP. As it falls, so does the GDP. They track perfectly. You can see who's at the top here. Now, what I want you to think about here that's so utterly important to you is that we will never solve the world's problem of hunger by taking from wealthy and giving it to, giving it to the poor. It will never happen. There isn't enough. But if we can teach people how to feed themselves, and we can raise entrepreneurship by 10%, it will increase the GDP by 23, 22, 23 trillion dollars. Do you know what the global, uh, do you know what the US's GDP is? It's 18 to 19 trillion dollars. So it's like being able to take more than the US 
sprinkling it throughout the world, and that, my friends, allows us to be able to solve the problem of uh, world poverty. And so this matters. If you really want to get on a kick of something that will change the world, then get on the kick of innovation and go change the world. When I think about at least a couple of the companies that I founded, one of the things that gives me the greatest satisfaction is knowing that we changed the entire way uh, that a process is done in business that brought efficiencies that were massive to industries in two different times now. So I'm not going to have time to go through this right now uh, because I want to spend some time on the last slide. So 14 top lessons learned for you to think about, okay? Number one, identify your gifts, talents, passions, and interests, and develop them. Okay? So I want you to think about them. God didn't give you these talents and gifts that you have to waste. If you want a clue into who you are, just look at your gifts. And then you develop those gifts. If you're not ready to start a business yet, then gain some experience, just like I did. I spent seven years in the trenches before I started my own business. I wasn't ready to start a business when I was 22 years old, but then again, I didn't have your education or background or the tools that exist today, and I didn't have Brigham Young University, which it didn't have then, by the way, either. A program like this that could show you to how to actually start a business while you're in school and allow you to be able to succeed at a super high level from the beginning. Read from the best startup and leadership books, and you can go back to the, uh, the scriptures here if you want to look about what that means. Choose your partners very carefully, it's a big deal. Before you establish a cap table, notice how I've got underlined there, before you establish that ownership table or equity or articles of corporation, consult with somebody who knows what they're doing because you'll destroy your company if you don't. It does. 90% of the time, that's how companies go down, is because of arguments and infighting between the original founders. Develop a money plan before you start. In other words, you're going to have to be able to survive for a period of time until you have a successful, profitable company. So you've got to figure out how you're going to make ends meet. For me, I mortgaged a house. Money makes people do funny things, and integrity and character mean more. I've given away more money into the millions because of wanting to protect my character and integrity in the middle of a disagreement. I said, well, it doesn't matter to me. The money doesn't matter to me. If it matters to you, good. It doesn't matter to me. So let's just do this, and we'll call it good. I've done that five times. Pretty expensive, but you know what I have intact? I have my character. No one can say that I never didn't treat them fairly. I don't care about the money. Honestly. Honestly. I don't care about the money. I care about becoming all of the things that I need to to get back home to God. That's what I care about. Then take good care of your own money, but take better care of somebody else's. If somebody invests in you, you have a fiduciary responsibility, look up the word, to protect that money and do everything you can to provide the return you promised. Find out what you don't know and then know it, because what you don't know will rise up and bite you and kill you in business. So find out what it is that you don't know and then know it. Pay attention to bottlenecks. You know what a bottleneck is? There are things that stop a business that keep it from flourishing. We call them bottlenecks. Learn what they are, fix them, and move on. Um, owner development is a huge key. One of the things I learned is that the same, the same skill set that's necessary to run a million dollar business is not the same skill set necessary for a five million dollar or for a 40 or for a 100. So each step along the way, you're going to have to grow or the business will outgrow you. Be patient in taking your rewards. Yield big dividends later. I stayed at that low salary of 40000 for three years. It was really tough. I mean, we really went lean. 
But when we sold the business, we sold it for millions of dollars because we were patient in taking the rewards and decided we could sacrifice in the meantime. Don't do anything with your harvest money until you've uh, learned solid investment principles. Wait at least a year. If you ever sell a business, don't go. People are going to be tracking you down at your doorstep, I promise you. And finally, I want to share this very important principle. You can be a great spouse, a great parent, you can serve others, and you can still even have a hobby. You can still be a successful entrepreneur. You can have it all. Now, a lot of people you tell you can't do it, but I promise you that you can. Just think of the parable or the miracle of the fishes and the loaves. When you're doing everything that you can to be all of those things the best you can, remembering your priorities, everything will be perfect. All right, we're done for today. But these lectures, these Q&A sessions are super important. They're super important. It's where a lot of the real meat comes in. So I want you guys to come prepared with your questions. Join us up in 710. Let's have some pizza. We'll answer your questions, and we'll have a fantastic 30 minutes together. Thanks for being here, guys.